A Single Human by Elton Gar. The war between the Sidons and the Astralons had lasted for 300 years. At first it had appeared the Sidons would easily win, but the Astralons adapted to their tactics quickly, and the war fell into a stalemate. Both empires slowly changed their economies to focus almost entirely on war. And then a captain of one of the Sidon's battleships had an idea. There were many other races in the galaxy, but both the Sidons and the Astralons largely ignored them. They were too small to defend themselves against even a single one of their mile-long battleships. What if they come up with some strategy that we haven't? Captain Geotim asked, looking at the long table full of admirals and generals who had been in charge of the Sidon's strategy for hundreds of years. Are you suggesting that someone from a primitive race would be better at strategy than us? I'm suggesting they may think differently. And what can it hurt? Changing our tactics could disrupt our entire military strategy, the general said. I think it is worth making a small test. I vote to allow him to bring in a single advisor from one of the primitive races to see what they suggest, the Lord Admiral said. Fine. But we reserve the right to ignore their suggestions, the general said. Tyler looked across the alien bridge in awe. The entire ship was far beyond anything he could imagine. There were hundreds of Sidons on the massive bridge that was so big it had been broken up into sections, each section with a commander to run things. Each of those sections would send their commands to other parts of the ship, where tens of thousands of people would do their best to fulfill those orders. You want me to do what? Tyler asked, resisting the urge to play with the strings on his hoodie. Instead he straightened his back. This is a warship. We have been in a war for a long time. We would like you to look at our tactics and offer any insight you might have. Why me? My superiors had a long list of requirements. You fit all of them so I brought you here. Wouldn't you want someone with military experience? Tyler asked. Most of his understanding of the military came from Call of Duty, and he wasn't sure how accurate that was. Specifically no. They insisted that I couldn't pick anyone with enough expertise in any field to understand our tactics or technology, for fear that you would take it back to your human race, Captain Geotim said. I am happy to try. But if I don't know enough to understand your tactics, I don't see how I can suggest anything. I agree, but my superiors gave me direct orders. So let us start with you simply telling us about the best military tactic you know. Well, I don't know if it's the best. But I'm a fan of the Zerg Rush, Tyler said, feeling a bit more comfortable now that he was on a subject he understood. Could you explain this Zerg Rush? It's pretty simple. You build up a bunch of weak units really fast, then attack before the other person can create a defense, Tyler said. An interesting strategy. But our war has been going on for 300 years. Right. That makes things a bit harder. The other thing I sometimes like doing is spawn camping, Tyler said. You will have to explain each of these, I suspect. It's, well, you find out where the new soldiers are going to appear and then shoot them before they can defend themselves. I suppose we could attempt to target the areas that jump drives are most likely to bring them. But it seems easy to defend against. You'd think so, but I've gotten a lot of kills that way, Tyler said. You said you had no military experience, Captain Geotim said, glancing around nervously. I don't. I mean just video games. We simulate battles in a virtual environment, Tyler said. And you find this game like, Geotim said. The good ones. They also have games where you can just walk around or don't fight, but real gamers don't play those. Now this has some real promise. If we were to have our soldiers test strategies in a virtual environment, they could discover new ideas on their own, and we could make them less fearful of killing by making it as routine as you make it sound, Captain Geotim said. Then perhaps I should go home and you can try that, Tyler said, beginning to wonder if perhaps he should be careful. First, let us show you our strategy so we can get some suggestions. 
That way we do not have to return to your world again, Giatine said. There was something in his voice that suggested that returning to Earth was the last thing he wanted to do. With a simple order, one of the battles appeared on the screen. Tyler expected to have no idea what he saw. But instead he saw two long lines of ships. One of them was colored green, and the other yellow. There were lines coming from each ship towards the others, but each was intercepted by a line from the opposing ship. I assume those are weapons of some type, Tyler said, pointing at the lines. The most advanced missiles ever made. They are far more powerful than the nuclear missiles from your world. Is that why you shoot so few of them? Tyler asked. Phew. This ship can launch as many as 20 missiles every hour. Each of them capable of destroying an enemy warship, Giatine said. But they just shoot them all down. How does anyone win? Tyler asked. Ships have a limited number of offensive and defensive missiles. When they run out, they are forced to retreat. But wouldn't they just get more and then come back? How do you win? Tyler asked. The plan is for our economy to build rockets faster than theirs and eventually overwhelm them, the captain said. Why don't you just focus fire? Tyler asked. What do you mean? Well, let's say you're playing League of Legends and your team is attacking the other team. You don't just each attack one person. You all attack the carry or perhaps someone who is squishy. But the main point is that if you can kill one, then you can focus even more on the next one. But they'll have ships no one is shooting at, and all of our ships will have people targeting them, the captain said. You can certainly hope so. You've already established that you can defend against that. The ship's crews won't like being targets. But we can try it. Is there anything else? Just that I think the shooting so slowly is kind of stupid, Tyler said. We would prefer shooting faster as well, but the bombs are very difficult to handle. A single mistake could destroy our own ship. Then use smaller bombs. A smaller bomb doesn't guarantee to destroy the enemy ship when it hits, the captain said. But as it is, they don't hit. What if instead of one big bomb, you sent out 10 smaller bombs that will make it much harder for them to defend against? And when they hit, they won't destroy the enemy ship. But you'll damage them, which will make the next one more likely to destroy it. Or once you've done enough damage, then you use your ultimate and win. The captain looked at one of his sub-commanders and said, You're in charge of weapons. Why didn't you suggest this? Because no one would shoot weaker weapons. And I assumed that if there was a reason they would, someone would have thought of it already, the man said. Okay. Send the order. I want all of the ships in Sector 7 to shoot at the Astralan's ship designated A237. They should continue to defend themselves from whatever ship is shooting at them. After a few seconds, the ships on the screen began to turn, and Tyler said, Wait, this is a real battle? Why is everyone just sitting around? This battle has been going on for almost six months. Ships leave to get more missiles, but other than that, most things are routine and run by the computers. Tyler watched carefully as the lines from the green ships began to move towards a single yellow ship. He felt almost good when he saw the first one shot down. He had been enjoying this, but that was before he thought about it too carefully. But this was a war, and he was being asked how to kill people. The second and third lines were targeted as well. But there were dozens more, and after only about a minute, one of them struck, and a few seconds later, the enemy ship disappeared off of the display. Change targets to A236, the captain said, sounding far more surprised than Tyler. He then turned to him and said, This could change the entire war. And your other ideas. We need to bring in more of your people as advisors. I think I'd like to go home, Tyler said, as he watched the ships target another enemy ship full of what he assumed were thousands or tens of thousands of people he had no reason to want to see dead. For all he knew, they were on the right side of the war. Giatine sent the young human home on a shuttle and remained to watch the battle. A battle that had been going on for months ended in a few hours, though even by the end of it, the Astralons had begun to adapt as the other ships began to shoot down missiles not aimed at them. But it was too late for this battle. 
The Astralons had lost, and soon ships began to flee. As they did, Geotim connected to the Admiralty again, stepping into the same room he had visited with his plan to recruit human advisors. There were dozens more high-ranking people, including several from the government and others from the largest of the corporations. What have you done? The Lord Admiral said as soon as he saw Geotim. I won the battle. You were supposed to question the human and then consult with us. The Admiral said. I have every intention of doing that. He had several other excellent ideas that will give us a significant advantage in the next battles. There was murmuring, and then the Lord Admiral said, You idiot. We don't want a significant advantage. Our entire economy is built around this war. If we win, what will the factories make? How will we keep people in line? But what about the soldiers? What about them? No one on either side was dying until your human got involved. Now the Astralins are going to want a real war. And we can't just cover this one up. Too many people saw what happened. What do you suggest we do now? Perhaps we should ask the humans for advice, Geotim said, realizing that everything that had mattered in his life had been a lie. Author's Note I wish the idea of the eternal war was a bit more far-fetched. But I think we all know that it isn't. But of course, that's more related to the setting than the main part of the story. The main part really is about how much more a teenager who plays strategy games understands about combat and war than they might think. The Zerg Rush is a pretty good strategy, and while it wasn't quite the same thing, using fast-moving troops to overwhelm your enemy's defenses worked pretty well in World War II as well. And focusing on disrupting a single part of the enemy line has been one of the primary strategies for warfare for most of recorded history. In truth, the most unrealistic part of this is that the aliens hadn't thought of it themselves. Which is why I added the ending. The aliens in this story are still far worse at strategy than humans, but they would have adapted their strategies in some way, except of course, if they didn't want the war to end. Another thing that is painfully easy to imagine, as we watch people try the same strategies that have failed so many times before in the real world. Elton Gar